I'll take care of that. And anyone else who is interested. <coughs> Our speaker tonight, uh, as you can see, is Brian Lenz. He's Collision's uh, campaign manager for the American Bird Conservancy. Uh, glass collisions kill up to a billion. Uh, by the way, here is Brad. Brad, hold your hand up. This is this is the guy that you see for saw wet owl banding. Okay, I'm sorry to interrupt the introduction, Brian, but I just had to do it. I'm about to leave. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, glass collisions go up to a billion birds per year, and ranks number one preventable cause of bird death in North America. Free roaming cats are number two. That uh, is news to a lot of people. Both common and rare species are at risk. As the uh, campaign manager, it is Brian's goal to reduce the collision threat that the built environment, especially glass, poses to birds. Brian came to ABC uniquely qualified for the job. He was director of the Community Conservation Program of the Bird City Wisconsin Program and built the program to over 100 active municipalities. For 10 years, Stevens Point has been one of those municipalities, nine of them at the highest high flyer level. Brian also worked with the Milwaukee Bucks to make their arena bird collision friendly, the first sports arena in the world to be built bird friendly. And he spent the morning with a public broadcasting company uh, and they're going to do a special video. So without further ado, I introduce Brian Lenz. Thank you. Oh, you know what? Almost forgot the microphone. Uh oh. I, I'm loud, but. <laughs> we just had on the news this evening how hundreds of chimney swifts hit the NASCAR Hall of Fame building and were killed. Oh, really? Over 100 were killed, 100 were injured. That's a, a big event because chimney swifts are not frequent window collision victims. Um, I haven't seen the news today, but I'm sure I will see that tomorrow when I wake up. <laughs> Is this on? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, all right, well, thank you, Kent, uh, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for inviting me here. I do have to correct one thing, though. Cats are number one. Are they? Cats are 2.4 billion, wow. billion birds a year in the U.S. Wow. And wow. widow collisions, we say, up to a billion. And we'll talk about that in, in a minute. Thank you for the correction. Sure. <laughs> um, the cat issue is a lot tougher to deal with than the window collision issue yeah. because nobody will come and argue with me that windows should kill birds. But if we're talking about cats, there'll be a lot of people arguing that cats should be allowed to be out and killing birds. So. I'm, I'm happy I'm the collision campaign manager, not the <laughs> cat campaign manager. <laughs> he's a really nice guy, but he's got a tough job. Um, so this gets to that. Um, these are the, the drivers of bird declines that are anthropogenic or due to human activity in North America, the United States and Canada. The US is in green and Canada is in blue. So you can see cats are off the chart with 2.4 billion birds a year. Um, windows are 599 million birds a year in the U.S. Uh, we often say up to a billion. Um, the study was really conservative in the way they came up with the 599 million number. And those are based on studies that are a number of years old and each new building that goes up has more and more reflective glass and more glass overall. So you know, this is probably a fairly low estimate. That works out to 1.64 million birds a day. If you started counting right now and didn't sleep, didn't go to work, didn't do anything else, it would take you 19 years to count that high. Um, it's one of the few really close interactions with wildlife that everybody has had. You know, if you think, say, hey, name an intimate experience with wildlife that every single person has had. Everybody has heard a bird die at a window at some point. Most people have heard it more than once. And if you think about this number of people in the country, you can really quickly see the scale of the problem. The fact that everybody, most of whom are not paying attention for this or ever thinking about it, encounter this whether they want to or not, um, really speaks to the size of the issue. 
So this video, I quick have to escape out. Um, so even ESPN knows that this is a problem. This is one of their older commercials. I don't think we need the sound. They are, oh, did it just stop? It's showing on here. Well, I can see it and it's really funny. <laughs> So, all right, well, then we'll just skip that one. So, I believe you can act this out, isn't that true? Yeah, <laughs> careful, you're going to get it. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's not going to play. That's unfortunate. Well, so they're, here it comes. They're sitting in, a, in an office having a meeting, and a bunch of bird mascots are in the hallway, and they walk down the hallway one after the other smack into the window. And the first one, they kind of look and go, eh. And then the second one hits again, and they go, man, we have got to get this glass frosted. So even in that decade-old commercial, ESPN was making light of the fact that birds hit windows. So it really is something that everybody knows about. Um, it's a problem everywhere that you have glass. You know, it's possible for a bird to hit a piece of glass that big. The bigger the glass, the more likely a bird is going to hit it, but glass in itself is a threat. So it happens in Wisconsin, downtown, and in your yards, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, these are birds. This was one pass of the skywalk at the Milwaukee County Courthouse. And each yellow arrow is a bird. Um, and so those are some of the, the birds that they have picked up in their monitoring. Um, they have a Wisconsin Night Guardians for Songbirds program that monitors buildings in Milwaukee. Um, fortunately, some of them survive and they're able to, to rehabilitate. Um, so I kind of covered the 600 million versus a billion. You might hear me say up to a billion, 600 million. I'm really talking about the same thing. Um, one question that often comes up with a number that big is, well, if it's really that many, how come I'm not stepping over birds every time I walk outside? And the answer to that is, uh, has a couple facets. The first is that that's spread out over the entire country. So we're talking about a pretty massive landscape to scatter that many <coughs> small bird carcasses every year. It's also over 365 days. And there are a lot of things out there that pick those up. Um, People pick them up, you know, if you have a facilities manager, nobody wants to step over that when people are coming in to go shopping or show up for work. Um, monitors often look for seagulls and crows and other birds in bushes because then they know, oh, we gotta get there quick before the, the seagulls eat all of the collision victims that probably hit that window. Squirrels, chipmunks, chipmunks will do it. Raccoons, foxes, cats, those guys will habituate and know which windows are frequent bird strike windows and kind of add that to their route as they go and look for food. So there's a lot of stuff out there picking them up. You also have a lot fall into waterways, get blown onto rooftops, they fall in vegetation. If there are grates that are in the street, they fall through the grates. So one of the things we talk about for collisions is you want the grates to be small so that if a bird does hit the window and manages to survive it, it doesn't fall through the grate and then die because it can't fly back out. Um, <clears throat> most of what we see as a window collision problem are songbirds, which migrate at night and hit windows by daytime. Um, Non-songbirds do hit windows. A red-breasted merganser hit one of the windows at Northwestern. Um, going back to ESPN, last year they had a turkey vulture fly through one of the windows in their office building. Um, we, I said, oh, quick, send a tweet to ESPN because we got to really hit them for that. Um, so we we're, were trying to kind of play up on it. They didn't reply, unfortunately. Um, so you get birds migrating at night and hitting during the day. Um, most migration, at least you know, the, the long jumps of migration, are birds flying overnight. And they can fly and sleep at the same time. They're not fully asleep but they can shut off part of their brain and alternate it so that they are getting a little bit of rest. It's not nearly what they would get if they were perched in a tree, but it's enough to kind of help them be able to keep going. Um, if you think about the 599 million a year and where those happen, 
the first thing most people think of, it's the big buildings downtown. And that is actually the opposite. So less than 1% of all of the collisions happen in buildings that are 12 stories and up. 44% of 253 million hit homes and low-rise buildings up to three floors, and 56% hit buildings that are four to 11 floors. Um, so if you fixed every single tall building in the country, tore them all down, rebuilt them to be all bird-friendly glass, all you have knocked off is less than 1% of the issue we've got going. So this really does require you know, municipalities to do it and homeowners to do it and building managers. Um, in terms of where on a building a bird is likely to hit, you know, this kind of breaks down. You can see the, the elevation. Uh, the typical migration heights for many different types of birds. But most of the collisions happen in the first 50 to 100 feet. Because if you think about a bird being active during the day, they're not 500 feet in the air. Some of them are, some of the time. You know, if you're going to see a seagull going past, but seagulls aren't the problem. The songbirds are in the trees and the vegetation or just above it. And that is where they're interacting with glass and buildings, and so that is where most of the collisions happen. So if you have a 100-story building, and you would say, I'll do you know, the first four floors and nothing above it, I'd say that's terrific. I would want it to be a little higher, but I'm not so worried about the 100th floor, because um, this, this stuff is not free. Um, so why does it happen, and what can we do to prevent it? The number one rule that underlies what will be a, a collision threat is the more glass, the more chances of a collision. And this is a nice picture because you can make sure I can work my own pointer. Um, you can kind of see how buildings have changed over time. This building, I'm, I don't have the actual dates for these, but I'm guessing this was a building from the 30s or the 40s. Small windows, not very reflective, not very much glass. Then you get to the 70s and the 80s, more glass is starting to become reflective, and this is what we do today. It's all glass. And a lot of the skyscrapers and the really big buildings are now pretty much all glass. And so over time, you know, we've been one, building more buildings, but two of the things we build are becoming worse, at least for birds. And for energy efficiency, that is terrible. Once you get over about 30, 35% glass in a building, the energy costs go up exponentially. So it is not an energy efficient way to build a building either, even if you use um, high quality insulated glass. Um, with the glass itself, there are really three problems. These are all fairly straightforward. The first is that the glass is reflective. It shows trees and habitat, or it shows the sky. Pretty much the bird gets a reflection of a place it thinks it can fly. Um, and it doesn't have to be habitat or trees. If you have a building downtown that is reflecting another pathway that would be a street behind it, the bird would say, I'm going to fly down that street between those buildings, except there's a building there. Uh, clear glass, um, kind of easy to think about with the skyway, skywalk. Um, birds can see straight through it, so there's no reflection, but they think they can fly straight to whatever is on the other side. Um, that can happen at building corners too. So if you have a window where birds are hitting one of the windows and it looks straight through to the other one, sometimes all you have to do is close the blinds on one of the two. If, ref if reflection is your problem, you're not gonna really make a difference, but if it's birds thinking they can fly through it, you might, you might help. Um, a lot of larger buildings also put vegetation in the lobby, which is nice on the inside, but if you're a bird stuck in downtown, because that is where a storm made your migration flight end, that looks like a good place to go and hide, and they hit those windows then. Lighting gets talked about a lot with collisions, um, and it certainly, is important. I think the importance might be a little bit overstated. Sorry, I have been talking a lot today. <laughs> um, so lighting in birds generally works in two different ways. The first is that there's something called a beacon effect, which is where you have a really bright light against a really dark background. And these are the, the World Trade Center Memorial lights. And each one of these dots here is a bird that's stuck in the light. So when they migrate at night, 
they are relying on kind of the overall dark blue sky for the magnetic field vision in their eyes to work correctly. And blue artificial human light throws that whole system out of whack. So they lose their ability to navigate. So at more of a distance, it will kind of draw them into a city. But with a, a beacon effect like this, where they're going along and then all of a sudden they're in light, they'll just circle and spin and stay there. And so New York City Audubon and um, I think in Cornell, they have people who monitor these. And when the monitor says, all right, turn them off, someone walks around and it takes five minutes to turn them all off. And then the lights go, dip, go dark. And within a minute or two, you, you could hear, chirp, 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 and you could see all these birds, then there's nothing and they're all gone because they immediately reorient and start going again. Wow. The beacon effect on individual buildings with strong vanity lights can be kind of magnified with bad weather. So when it's foggy or stormy, birds fly lower because it's <laughs> not a smooth ride up high. But when you have all that extra moisture in the air, it kind of magnifies the light signature of the building, uh, of the building lights. So that can draw birds into those buildings at night. The beacon effect, however, doesn't happen a whole lot anymore. So if you had one or two really, really strong lights right in the middle of downtown Houston, and I said, turn those off, for a bird, they're still stuck because they didn't fly there for that one or two strong buildings. The birds that were stuck in the Trade Center lights were not there because of the Trade Center lights. They were there because it's on a coast and they were drawn into the city of New York by all of the lights put together. <coughs> so what we really need is a more of a systemic effort at having lights out in all buildings and, and everything should be shielded down so that there's no light trespassing up. And I mean, even if you just think, you can see where the main streets are here. And there's no need for a street light to be visible from above. So it's fairly simple things. You're not gonna change this in a week. Um, but you know, <coughs> involving like the Department of Transportation in something like this, when they replace lights or change bulbs, you can get shields to put on existing lights. There are things you can do that will take steps in the right direction towards addressing the fact that there's this much light and birds are being drawn into a city. And so they're getting drawn in at night and then in the morning, where are they? They're in a forest of shiny reflective glass with small trees and not a whole lot of habitat. So everything that looks like habitat is gonna be twice as important and twice as desirable because there's not as much there. Um, so you end up kind of sucking them into a bad place. In terms of why collisions happen so often for birds, there are, are several cool things about um, bird vision, especially when you compare it to uh, our vision. Um, one of them is that most birds have the eyes on the side of their head. So if that robin's looking at you head on and you're in front, he's, he doesn't see you. He might see kind of a shadowy, but the robin's vision is to the side and to the back. If you're a raptor and you need to hunt and have really good depth perception to be able to eat, they have binocular vision. So their eyes are in the front of their head like ours. So they see better in front of them than a robin. But most birds look like this with the eyes on the side of the head, which means they don't see very well in front of their beaks. Um, and that can kind of be an issue because it means if you're gonna put a pattern on something so that a bird can see it, it's gotta be a pretty strong pattern. And because we have good binocular vision in front, any pattern a bird can see, we can see. But we can see all kinds of patterns that the birds can't. And it would be terrific if it was the other way around because it would be a lot easier to get everybody to just put stuff on windows because nobody would ever see it. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, I used to study monkeys. So for the bird groups, I have to get in, that's an owl monkey. <laughs> so primate eyes are all set forward. That's one of the, the characteristics of primates. Um, birds can also see the Earth's magnetic field, some species of birds. Disability is not constant throughout the year, though. Um, studies of, I can't remember if it was a European robin, they, they had them in the lab and 
the bird would start orienting itself and trying to move <coughs> south from its cage in, in fall. And in summer, it didn't do it. So this is not something that's constant throughout the year, but it is that thing that blue light really throws this off. And it's an, an important way that birds are able to, to migrate. Uh, this is just to illustrate the contrast sensitivity difference. So, you know, the ability to see a pattern that we just talked about. Uh, you know, we can see, I don't know how good your guys' eyes are, but <laughs> we can see a lot further down this way than a bird. So if you say most people can see to here, you know, a bird can see to here. So for the bird, the pattern has to be a lot stronger than it does for us. Um, there are also a number of species of birds that can see ultraviolet light. Um, and because the, they have four peaks in the rods and the cones in their eyes and the wavelengths that they can see, and they're really distinct, not only can many birds see ultraviolet, but the colors they see are in different combinations than what we see. So when a bird sees even the non-ultraviolet world, it doesn't look the same as the world does to us. As you can see, these two are kind of smushed together for us. Whereas for birds, they're really separate. So they can see things as distinct that we can't. Um, the ultraviolet, though, <coughs> presents a potential opportunity to have window collision products that a bird can see that we can't see, which is kind of what you're going for. Although, because there are a lot of birds that, again, can't see UV like doves, it's not going to be a solution at all for them. The windows are going to be the same as they were before. I think this one's going to work. So people think we can see glass, but we can't. So here's a woman trying to leave a shopping mall. She's not on her phone, she's not reading a book, she's not talking to anybody. <laughs> all she wants to do is get out of the mall. And we'll play that again, because it, well, it started all playing. So there's two sliding doors that are in the middle with glass panes on, on either end. Oops. So it opened for her, and she said, no, nah, not good enough, and walked right into the glass. And I think everybody in here has hit their head or their hand on a sneeze guard, walked into a screen door, bumped into a window, which really illustrates we don't see glass either, even though we think we do. He wants to keep showing you the video now. <laughs> wouldn't cooperate at first, and now it's like, hey, let's keep showing. <laughs> so we think we can see glass. In, in this example over here, you know that this window is open because you're looking at the window frame. Mm -hmm. If I took that window frame out and said, which one of those is open, you couldn't tell me. Mm -hmm. Same thing in offices. A lot of offices are now saying, oh, hey, wouldn't it be cool if everybody had a glass wall? Mm -hmm. Except the people who work in those hate it because they run into it. Mm -hmm. And so they put little dots in the window. And that's not because it looks cool, it's to give people an indication that, hey, you can't walk it here. Um, and the same thing here, you know, this kid walked up and put his hands on the window because he knows, hey, when I see a window frame, there's a piece of glass there. A bird never understands those kind of concepts. So they don't say, oh, hey, that's open, I can go through that. They see the glass as being habitat and the cues don't mean anything. So individual birds can learn about like one piece of glass. So if you have a bird in a zoo exhibit and it keeps bumping into a window, eventually it's gonna stop going over to the place where it's bumping into the window. Not because it says, you know, that's glass, I'm not gonna go there anymore. It's because it's tired of hitting its head on whatever is over there. But if you take that bird and put it in a different exhibit, it's gotta start all over again. So it can understand I'm not going to go there because of what happens, but it doesn't see, hey, that's glass, and then extrapolate out to other situations. And it's also not just traditional windows that are a problem for birds. Um, we usually talk about window collisions because it drives the point home easier, but really we should be saying glass collisions. Um, you know, there are all kinds of buildings and noise barriers. I mean, why would you need a clear noise barrier. You could put some of the things we're going to talk about into that clear noise barrier, 
people would still see the same exact view at 55 miles an hour and no birds would ever hit it. But again, unless somebody has pointed that out to you, why would it even occur to you that you should have a pattern in that? So that's kind of what ABC is out trying to do is provide the information and the education that people need to start thinking about these issues. Uh, bus stops are also really bad. Um, so how do you figure out what works and what doesn't work? It used to be people would say, and they're called hawk decals, except I think it was a Kestrel. Um, throw a hawk decal on your window and you're good. <coughs> the problem with that is nobody knew if it worked or not. And the only thing that that actually ends up doing is keeping a bird from hitting the hawk decal. So unless you're gonna cover your window in hawk decals, all you've done is taken care of this big of a section of your window. <coughs> Which is better than nothing, but is not really what people are after. So, in trying to come up with how to, how to figure out what works and what doesn't, and actually be able to prove to somebody that it works or it doesn't. Um, there was a, a guy in, in Germany who invented a, a testing tunnel, and ABC then created one that is similar to his, but a little different. Well, it's also not in Germany, it's here. <laughs> so it's a little easier for us to get to. Um, and the tunnel is at the Powder Mill Nature Reserve, and they have a big banding program. And once they band a bird, if it's still in good shape, they put it back in the bag, and we take it to the tunnel, and we run it through the tunnel once, and then use, it, use a different bird. If it's stressed, when we take it out, straight out of the bag, and off it goes. Um, so this is only things that are in good shape, and it's only for one extra time. Let's see the next slide. Yeah, okay. So, there's a hole at the, the far end of the tunnel, and the inside is lined in black felt. And that hole kind of has felt draped over it. So when you stick your hand through, it kind of goes around your hand so there's not light coming through. The far end of the tunnel has two panes of glass, which look like this from the outside. Um, at the beginning of each migration season, spring and fall, we especially do, we do the most in fall because that's when there are the most birds. Um, we run a control where we have two panes of clear glass in the tunnel. And we make sure that birds go 50, about 50-50, plus or minus 5%, to make sure it's going random and there's nothing cueing them and making them go one direction more than the other. Then we swap one of these out for whatever glass product it is we want to test. And then we keep putting birds through the tunnel and recording which way they go. Um, and every, I can't remember if it's every 10 trials, we switch the sides, and then we take the product out after those 10 and put in a different one. And so to get to the 80 to 100 flights for that one piece of glass, it's got to be put back in there five times and each time move from each side to each side. So we're trying to do as much as we can to control for environmental variables. Mm -hmm. um, there is a shield behind it so that it gives you a uniform pattern as kind of a, fly, a flyway. <laughs> <coughs> and these two mirrors right here put sun onto the front of the glass so you can actually reach through right here and we want the sun on the front of the glass because that's where the sun is going to be hitting when a bird is approaching um, you know, a building and we don't test highly reflective products this is not for testing reflection so we say you know the glass has to have like a 14% level of reflection or less Pretty much you can't make it shiny and like a mirror. Otherwise, we just say, ah, we're not even gonna test it because it's not gonna work. Because if you put a pattern behind a mirror, the mirror overwhelms the pattern and you get nothing. So you need to be able to see through the glass at least most of the time. Um, so over and over again, and then the, the products get a score. And we can use that score um, to kind of come up with calculations, which we can talk about in a little bit, um, so people can actually figure out how much of the glass they need and on what parts of the building to put it. And we always advocate for do the whole thing or you know, do the first 75 feet. And they say, in what? And we say, bird-friendly glass, which is something that got a 25 or lower in the tunnel, which would mean it, of all of the flights, 25% of them flew towards the test product. So nothing is ever 100%. And Almost nothing in the tunnel gets above a 90, or excuse me, below a 10. 
So, you know, a zero would be a brick wall. Nothing's going to fly into a brick wall. 100 would be clear glass. There are not a whole lot of things that score below a 10, which would be the ideal products because it essentially takes away your whole window. And we know that kind of stuff works. But a panicked bird with two options, both of which are light, trying to get out, is still going to pick wrong sometimes. So we think that in the field, those work better than our scores would indicate because it is not, it's more of a natural situation for the bird. Um, the pattern on the, the glass products or the retrofits that you put on existing windows is really important. Um, part of the reason figuring out the pattern dimensions that uh, will work is that birds are really agile. So they don't have to do a whole lot to fly through very tiny gaps. And they actually have been shown in captive settings in research labs that before they go through that, they do an extra hard flap or two and go up because they're going to compensate because they know they can't flap their wings as they <coughs> sink through the gap that they're flying through like that. But when you think about trying to put up a pattern on a window that is going to prevent a bird from just going, oh, hey, I'll go through there, it makes the pattern narrower and narrower and narrower to be more and more effective. And you know you can think going in and out of the nest cavity. They're not going to sit at the top and advertise that their young are in there. They're going to go in quickly and come out quickly. Um, same thing with flying through trees and, and habitat. Um, they have to be agile. So the solutions kind of revolve around a visible pattern that birds see as a barrier. Um, just to illustrate, I'm going to use lines that are two inches apart. Um, they don't have to be lines. You can have dots or squiggles, or but the two-inch spacing is kind of the important part. Um, it used to be called the two-by-four rule, which was first come up with by Dan Clem, who does testing as well, but he's just got his windows in the field. So birds are actually hitting his windows. And he, I should have mentioned, we have a net in front of the windows in the tunnel so that birds bounce and then we pick them up and off they go. It's not just like a big pile of big birds. <laughs> That's on the other side of the tunnel. I didn't show that in the picture. Um, but it, you know, Dan Clem's testing is actually out with glass that birds are actually hitting. Um, and he came up with a two by four rule, which is if the pattern was had to be two inches or closer if they were horizontal, and he said four inches if they were vertical. But a four inch pattern, if you look at the wingspan of a chickadee or a hummingbird, hummingbird's wingspan is about four and a quarter. So a four inch to go through that, it has to go, which is nothing. So if you like hummingbirds, four inches is probably not gonna be enough to solve a hummingbird collision problem. If the things that are in your windows are wood thrushes, four inches is probably gonna be okay. So it kind of, it, it's up to you how, you know, how much of a, how, how tight the pattern can be that you will be okay with having on your windows. Um, something is better than nothing, but if you put those up and they were 10 inches apart, I don't really know how well it would work. Some things from far away would say, I'm not gonna go there, but once it is up close and it's kind of decision time, they're just gonna go through as if there's nothing there. Um, the pattern elements would be each of the, the lines here need to be an eighth of an inch or bigger. Uh, the bigger the better, kind of the general rule. Um, so lines are one of the most effective patterns because th there's no confusion for a bird about whether it can fit through that. Um, when you get to dots and things, you know, some of the, the dimensions <coughs> change because the bird's ability to think they can fit through it changes um, as you change the pattern. Um, Another solution we talk about is lights out. We mentioned this a little bit before. Um, we generally talk about it being from 11 p.m. or midnight until after sunrise. Some places say until 6 a.m., but if you look at migrating birds overnight, you don't really have collisions at 8 p.m., 9 p.m., 10 p.m., 11 p.m. It's again, they're having their flight paths changed, especially in the early hours of the morning, right before sunrise. And there's something, I always call it the wrong names. I think it's civil twilight. Yeah, that's right. I like to call it citizen twilight for some reason. Uh, it's like my favorite old movie or something. Um, 
Civil, civil twilight is the moment before the sun is actually up when everything is, is actually light. And by that point in the morning, almost all the migrating birds are down. So, you know, from 2 p.m. or 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m., 5 a.m., you have birds dropping out when they find they're in a good spot. But once you get right before dawn, most of them fall out wherever they are. So if you have lights on in these last couple hours of the morning, you're drawing birds in. And as we know, when daylight happens, changes over spring and fall. So if you set a hard, hey, 6 a.m., they can go back on, it might work for some of the time and might not work for other parts of the time. So we just say leave them off until the following night. And you probably really don't need to worry about it until you know, 2 or 3 in the morning even. 11 p.m. or midnight is probably a little early. I'm trying to come up with a, a better way to look at that and write a paper that would kind of say, hey, here's what you should do and why. Uh, but it's not easy data to find. Um, so in Wisconsin, you can sign up with the Wisconsin Humane Society if you're going to do a lights out program. Uh, there are a lot of other ways to do that too. Um, so here you can see the vanity lights are out, but nothing else. And the street lights, if you were looking from above, are all still on. So you've made a difference, but for a migrating bird, you know, they're not flying into the city because of one of those. Once they get there, they might be really attracted to that building, but if you turn it off, the bird's still there, and they're gonna wake up down here and hit this dark building that's dark at two in the morning. This was a 2003 blackout. Something on that scale would be terrific. <laughs> but the birds in there migrated just as they did a thousand years ago. Um, but you can see from here, you know, birds are not migrating from space, so they don't see the same light footprint. But you can see how big of a problem we've got. And it gets bigger and bigger every year. And this is two, a 2003 image. So the, the light footprint is bigger now than it was when that was taken. And a lot of municipalities to save energy, which is a good thing, are switching to LED streetlights, which while they save energy are like 10 times brighter than the streetlights that are in this picture. So we're saving energy, but making this light problem bigger. And a lot of the LEDs that are going in are blue, or have a lot of blue wavelengths, which is, again, the color we don't want if you're a migrating bird. Um, we're starting to talk to the International Dark Skies Association, which works on light pollution for people, because there's all kinds of negative impacts on people for blue light, you know, sleep issues and cancer rates, and all kinds of things where there's a bunch of correlations which is not the same as causation necessarily, but it kind of makes you wonder. Um, so we're trying to figure out how they can talk about birds a little bit and how we can talk about people and how we can work together on the same issue. This is just cool. There was an artist that took a bunch of cities around the world and then went and found what the night sky would be at that place, but from a different place that didn't have a light pollution issue, often in a desert somewhere. So this is what New York City skyline and sky should look like at night, mm. except you can't see a single star in New York. Um, so the, I mentioned the International Dark Skies Association. They have a website, and I think they're going to work to redo the kind of fixture finder tool that they've got. But they have a bunch of examples of don't do this and do this. And you can see they're all shielded and down facing. So, you know, you want the light focused on the ground. It doesn't need to be anywhere else. And, you know, if you think about driving down the street, all those lights, street lights shining in your face, you don't really need that because that's the light going sideways. It should all be down on the ground, which is where you actually need it. Um, the other part of this is to avoid <coughs> uplighting. So a lot of people like to take lights and do that and point them at a building or their house. But that's going up. And so that's going straight into the sky and really adding to this issue. Um, and there have been studies, even in suburban areas, of like a nature reserve with a suburb and a bunch of homes. And the birds act differently when they're, I don't remember the direction, but one of them they were lower and vocalizing more. I think they were lower and vocalizing more over the homes than they were over the, the park. So even street lights and porch lights and, you know, those things add up and cause behavioral differences. Um, how am I doing on time? I don't know. Do five. I'm okay. Um, when it comes to how you manage new construction, 
Um, there is the U.S. Green Building Council has a LEED program, which generally people talk about for an energy-friendly, water-friendly, materials-friendly building. Um, ABC has gotten a bird-friendly building credit put into that. It's all optional, so nobody has to do it. Uh, we're trying to fix that too. <laughs> At least make some minimum of bird protection part of being a sustainable building for everyone. Uh, these are big uphill climbs, though, to get these kinds of things done. Um, the the lead credit involves using visible glass. So again, you have to have the patterns we talked about. You have to make sure the uplighting you don't uplight, and that you participate in lights out during spring and fall migration. And then you're supposed to monitor the building for three years after so that we get a little bit of real world data back on how these different things are performing. And when you look at the problem areas of the buildings that you see, because nothing is perfect and there probably still will be problem areas, one, we need to know, and two, you can come up with a plan to go and try and fix the problem area so that the building is better. Um, you can see here, there's a, a focus on the first three floors or one floor adjacent to a green roof. We're working on revising the credit to kind of bump that up. Um, this was first put in the, the lead library in 2009 when we weren't even sure if anybody would do this. So a lot of the ordinances that are now being passed don't do this. They say you have to have word friendly glass on at least 90% of your glass up to 30, 50, 75 feet. So just every building has to do that. They're almost always limited to buildings that are tall. <laughs> so this doesn't apply to those short buildings, which as I mentioned is 99% of the issue. Um, so you know the ordinances are great, but they need to be a little broader. Um, and some of them are also tied to being adjacent to water or a green space. So if your building is within 300 feet of a park, you have to do it. If you're not within 300 feet of a park, you don't. Except birds are really, really mobile and 300 feet of a park. There's a lot of birds in the park, sure, but they don't stay in the park. They move around. So again, it's a good thing to do. It just would be nice if it was a little, a little broader than that. Um, oh, I should also mention, um, if you do this in the design phase of the building, it adds almost no cost, which is great. Fritted, fritted glass, which is uh, uh, this glass right here, is glass that has a ceramic pattern put on one surface of it. And architects use that all the time. It's usually for reducing heating and cooling costs or for keeping rooms so that they're not so bright so that people can work inside without a bunch of glare and blinding light. Um, so they're really familiar with that. Um, but if you change the pattern on that to make it a bird-friendly pattern, you get all those same benefits plus birds aren't gonna hit it. And that only costs a couple of bucks a square foot more than glass without that. And so when you talk about the cost of an entire building project, it's not even, you know, it's 0. 0.0 something percent of it. It's in a marginal. People change stuff in buildings all the time. There's always, here's the number, plus or minus, usually plus, 10% <laughs> contingency for when we wanna change a bunch of stuff. And so this doesn't even really register as a change. Although if you've got someone who is going into it saying, I don't want to do that, even if it's going to be another $10,000 on a $20 million project, they've got an argument, <laughs> which is kind of unfortunate. Um, so that's for the glass. This building <laughs> on top here is the Jacob Javits Center in New York, which is one of the buildings that is monitored by New York Audubon Society. And that was one of the worst bird killing buildings that they monitored. It was fairly reflective glass and the whole thing was glass and you can, it's not hard to see why. But they, the owners of the building decided that they needed to fix it for energy efficiency. And they had been told a lot of times about how many birds would die in there. So this is actually now fritted glass. That is fritted. So you can't even tell until you're right up close to the window. And the bird fatalities dropped by like 95%. So it went from picking up tons of birds all the time to almost never picking up anything. And it helped with the energy efficiency costs. Um, so really, and you can't tell. 
Oh, and the, the building you're getting. I'm the sorry. Jacob Javits, J A V I T S Center. Um, and you know, for for a bird to be able to avoid glass, it doesn't need to be able to see the pattern from 500 feet away. Because how far away is a bird from a window when it hits the window? Zero feet. <laughs> so it needs that 10 to 15 foot, depending on the speed of the bird, 10, 10 to 15 foot buffer where it can start to see, oh, there's a pattern there and be able to correct and turn. Which is helpful because then you know we don't need to see it from far away and you can still look through it like a normal window. Um, there are all kinds of other solutions too. Um, you know, if you have like a, a false facade, um, there are a lot of metal grates and interesting uh, artistic things that people now put up. You can have whatever kind of windows you want behind that because there's a physical barrier and no bird is going to go, hey, you know what, that looks like trees over there. They're going to go a different direction. And so you're actually physically blocking the window. Um, there are a number of other things you can do, sun uh, louvers and sun shades and um, etching and all kinds of different things. Anything that puts something in front of the glass or creates a pattern. For an existing building though, it's not quite so easy and it is definitely not so cheap. Um, you usually can't change the materials. Windows do fail. So there is an option when windows fail or when somebody decides their building is costing too much to heat and cool and the windows are the, one of the first places you go to start trying to fix that problem. Um, so you can get folks if they're changing windows. Part of the problem on homes is that you've got old, old windows on the home and the coatings that they put on windows that make them really reflective didn't exist 50 years ago. Nobody did that. So you change the windows out that didn't have a problem and put in new windows that often are bigger. You often don't have the mullions and the individual small panes. Have the screens on the inside instead of on the outside and are now shinier than they were before. And people all the time say, I got new windows and now birds are hitting my house. It never happened before. So what's well, your new windows? So we're trying to work with home window companies too to get them to introduce lines of bird friendly products so that people at least have an option that is you know pre-existing for them you can ask for anything you want if you're willing to pay for the, the special upcharge they're going to get you for a custom product you could put any of this stuff in your home windows um, but we want it to be something that actually exists so that they can kind of scale the price down to make it affordable for more people so it costs more if you're going to actually do something in terms of changing the windows um, there's a lot of effort, no matter what solution there is, you have to do something. Building a new building, you change a line, scratch something out on your blueprint, someone else drops off new glass, and they put it in just like they were going to. There's not really a whole lot of effort beyond changing the plan. That is not the case for existing buildings. Um, it's also hard to know what windows are gonna be an issue and why, because there are a lot of things that influence um, what a problem window is on, a, on an existing building. And our collision campaign manager, this is Chris Shepard's window. <laughs> so we didn't go peep in some unwitting person's window to take these. <laughs> but it's the same window at different times of day. So at one, you can see straight through and see all the plants and you know, a bird might go, hey, I'm gonna land on that. One, it's gray and you see sky. And the amount of habitat visible can change uh, based on your approach angle and, and the light. So, which one of those was the problem? You see a dead bird. Why did it hit? Well, I don't know, because it did all these different things over the course of the day, and unless you're standing there when the bird hits and look at the window, you're kind of guessing. Um, there are a number of other things that come into it. Channeling is a big one. Um, so if you think about having a bird fly through here, they're not gonna fly through the trees on the sides, they're gonna fly through the middle. So you're kind of channeling the birds down the path. And if you put a glass wall at the end of the path, you're channeling them into a glass wall. So the only place a bird's gonna fly there is gonna be into the window. Um, and that happens quite a bit. And you can kind of think of it as a T intersection in downtown. If there's a building that covers the whole top of the T, birds are gonna come shooting up the street, especially if there's trees. And that's probably gonna be a bad spot on the building. I can't guarantee it, but if the building's got a problem, that's one of the areas I would suggest. If you go half a block down, 
where there's another building right across the street, there's not going to be too many birds flying back and forth across the street a bunch of times because that's not really how birds move. Um, planted courtyards and atria are also an issue because birds will be flying over and will drop down into that and see all the habitat and the, the, green, um, the green space. And then they go to go out and their first thing is not, I'm going to fly straight up. They say, oh, hey, look, I can go to that other plant over there, and they hit a window. Or they go up a little bit and they hit a window. Anything that is a corner is also bad. So even if it's not enclosed, if you have an L-shaped building, where those two parts meet is probably going to be an issue because birds fly in and it's confusing, and they go, oh, I can't go there, and they turn and they hit the other one. Um, so corners are bad. Uh, green rooftops are terrific. They're terrific for energy efficiency. They're terrific for holding rainwater so you don't have to have as big of a sewer system. They're terrible if you put a big glass thing in the middle of it, though. Oh. Because that's a, an urban oasis for a bird thinking, you know, in migration who's gassed and has to land. They go, oh my god, I can't believe how lucky I am. And they spend a day there, and then the next morning they hit the window. So it just takes a little bit of, of foresight, even on something that is really environmentally friendly and good. Um, and, you know, I don't fault people like this because they're trying to do the right thing and you can't know everything. Um, but it's just a good thing to talk about. Um, this has, chart has made the rounds quite a bit. And it's how close to your window should you put your bird feeder. And this is one meter away, five meters, ten meters. So three feet, 15, 30 feet. And the line represents the percentage of collisions that will be fatal from a bird leaving from that distance. So if your feeder is three feet away from your window, nobody's going to die if it hits your window because they're just not going fast enough. If you move it out to 15 feet, though, you get about 60% of the collisions will be fatal. And this was based on, I'm trying to remember, this is that, that Dan Clem, the gentleman who does the testing with the windows in the field. So he actually knows how many were fatal. Um, so from 15 to the 30 feet, you know, that's the deadly zone that stops there. That doesn't mean that if a bird is at 50 feet away and flies straight into your window, it's going to be better than if it was 30 feet away. Because they're going to be going faster and it will be going up. But at some point, you're not going to put the bird feeder <laughs> 100 yards away from your window because part of the point is to see the birds. So they just stopped the chart there. That doesn't mean, oh, well, let's go to... 31 feet more good. Um, the other thing it doesn't really talk about is what the frequency of collisions with your window is going to be. It talks about how many are going to kill the bird, which is pretty much based on the speed of the bird. So, you know, if you have your feeders at 10 meters away, there's a little more chance maybe for the bird to see other flight pathways than if it's, you know, 10 feet away. You know, if uh, a hawk flies by one side of the the feeder, birds going the other way. Doesn't matter what's there, it's not going to turn and go, hey, let me go check out the hawk. It's going the other way. And if it's the feeder is 40 feet away, there's a lot of other options that don't involve directly flying into your window. Window might still be a problem if it picks to go that way, but there are at least other options. So this is kind of presented as being a clear signal to put your feeders way far away and you're way far away or really close and you're good. And really the answer is if you've got a bird feeder, treat the window across from the bird feeder. You can put the feeder wherever you want if you put some of the things up that we're gonna, I'll show you in a second. If you've got a bird friendly treatment on the window, birds aren't gonna hit it, or it's gonna be very infrequent if they do. Um, so how do you fix a house? You've got a building, your house, your workplace, something you manage, own, operate. My goal, is to fix the problem windows and leave the rest. If you want to just say, I love birds, I'm going to do all of them, we can have a line after this and I'll give each one of you a hug. <laughs> <laughs> I don't expect anybody to actually do that, though. Because, you know, it takes work and it takes effort. So the way I, I say is, one, turn out the lights at night during migration. If you've got lights that shine out of your house, pull the blinds. Don't leave them on in rooms where you aren't. Don't leave the front porch light on. Don't leave the yard light on. Anything you can do to get the lights out during migration. Again, that's not going to 
be an earth-shattering change, but everybody has to do it. And it's easy. And it saves money. There's actually a cool um, Celine, S-E-L-E-N-E. -E. They have a lights out calculator. So if I go to some building and I say, well, you've probably got this many lights and you probably have them on overnight this much and the energy rate is this, I say, you turn them off during spring and fall migration and you'll save $45,000 a year. Then they listen. But if I just say, hey, turn them off for birds because, you know, hey, you know, let's hug a tree, they go, nah, I'm leaving them on because I think the building looks cool. But when you start bringing money into it, people, people listen. So back to, back to your house or an existing building. So pay attention. Everybody in here has heard a bird hit a window. If it's a building where you spend a lot of time, you probably know which windows those are. Those are your first target. If you've ever heard it before, you've heard only a fraction of what has hit that window because you just haven't been there for most of them, or if you have, you've had the TV on or been in the other room, and something came and picked the bird up after. So start with where you've heard the problem, which is, then come up with a plan. You pick one of the products we're gonna talk about, or you know, move the feeder or change you know, the landscaping or um, anything you can think of that might be a potential problem at that window. Then you do something, put up one of these solutions, and then you go back to the top, or you go back to number two. <laughs> you only turn the lights out once, right? Um, you go back to number two, and then you, you keep going. So you do, like, I've heard these two windows, you fix them, and then the next time you hear a bird hit a window, you fix it, and then the next time, and pretty soon you've done five windows in your house, and you're probably done. So that is really the best way to go about it. Again, if you want to do more, and just kind of have it done at once, that's terrific. Um, and again, you've probably picked up on this, but glass is more important than lighting. So if you're gonna do the lights, or you're gonna do the glass, do the glass. Um, and one other thing I forgot to mention with the bird feeders too, is if you've got, you know, say on the window pane, and you put the bird feeder right here, there's a lot of direct flight paths from the bird feeder to the window. If you're able to offset the feeder a little bit from the window, so that there is nothing at 90 degrees from the bird feeder, it might help a little bit. Nobody has done a study of that, but one thing you're going to do is any bird that's going to hit your window is going to be forced to hit it at an angle, which will help decrease the level of impact. And you're also, again, removing that direct, really short flight path away from the bird. And you can still see the feeder just as well if it's right in front of the window. Instead of standing here and looking, you have to stand here, which is not that big of an ask when you're talking about saving the birds that we love. Um, so yeah, we kind of just did this already. Um, if it's an actual building you're going to monitor, you would want to do it in spring and fall when there are, are going to be the highest likelihood of collision. Although collisions happen year round, it's not a spring and fall issue. Spring and fall is just when we have the most birds in the country, so that's why we have the biggest issue then. Um, if it is actually a building you're going to monitor, coming up with a plan for the injured bird that you find is a good idea so you can take it somewhere. Often a bird will be able to fly away and then they fly away and they die somewhere else because they've got an internal fracture or they've got a hemorrhage or they're bleeding or they lost some feathers or they hurt their eye or their bill got cracked. And if you take them to a rehabilitator, just today the Wisconsin Humane Society said of the live collision victims that come in, they can save about 80%. If that bird flies off, it's gonna be way under 80%. So, Kind of knowing where to go, and there are a number of wildlife rehabilitator sites, and I don't know, you guys probably all know where they are. <laughs> um, we're working on a monitoring plan. You know, if you're just doing your house, you don't need a monitoring plan. But if you actually want to start doing something larger, we're kind of coming up with guidelines for how to do that, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel and figure it all out. Um, when I mention recording, you know, start with the windows you know are bad. And you don't need to do everything necessarily. Um, this is the Northwestern University campus, and we've been working with them, and they've retrofit a few buildings. And a lot of monitoring programs say, well, at the Kellogg building today, we picked up 19 birds. And I, I said, well, the Kellogg building is huge. Where did you find them? So you need to pinpoint as much as you can where you found them, because you can see 20% hit in this stretch and 21% hit here. So if you're working with something that is going to be an expensive fix and something at this scale, if I can say, well, do these two parts and you're going to take off 40% of the issue, 
and you're going to have to spend a fraction of what you would have to do to do the whole thing. And then take the extra money you were thinking and fix the worst 46% here and the 26% here. You can take the worst parts off of a bunch of buildings as opposed to doing all of one and getting coverage on the thing that's almost not killing anything. So, you know, the goal is zero, but that's not really a realistic goal when you start talking about how much some of this stuff costs to do. So it's the same thing with your house. You know, kind of plan and make sure you're being efficient with what you're doing so that you can be effective. Um, did that. The other thing is, um, if you're gonna put one of the solutions up, which I think is the, the next slide. Um, I've been teasing the solutions a lot, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know if I said it at the beginning, you would have left, because that's what you're here for. <laughs> um, so any of the things we do outside of the window is the best. So each surface of the glass can add reflection. So a normal pane of glass, you know, there's one piece of glass. So you've got a surface one, which faces out, and a surface two, which faces in. If you've got double pane glass, which is now what there is, there's a surface three, which is the inside piece that faces out, and surface four, which is what faces in. And each one of those adds a little bit of reflection um, to the outside. The primary one is surface one, the outside. But for each reflection you put in front of your solution, so you're gonna put a post-it note on the inside, Sometimes in the day, that thing's going to be invisible. If the post-it note's on the outside, it's always going to be visible. It doesn't matter how strong the reflection is on the window. And sometimes outside is just not possible. Hey, I'm on the third floor of my office building, and they won't let me do anything, but I've got a corner office, and everything keeps hitting. Put something on the inside. It'll help some of the time. You do what you can. But if you can pick, it's your home windows, and they're on the first floor, and it's easy. Put it on the outside instead of the inside. Um, so, exterior screens. The old screens, were you hung them up on the outside of your window and they were on the outside. Now, all the manufacturers put them on the inside. So there is, you know, often it's a half screen instead of a full screen. They used to always be full because you just plunk the whole thing up there. I used to be a house painter, so I had to do a lot of plunking the screens up and down. Um, but now it's a half screen and it's put in between the panes of glass. So when it's open in the spring, you've got a half a screen. But in here, in summer, fall, and winter, <laughs> when those are closed, the whole, the whole window looks like this. And that is something that there's not enough reflection on for a bird to likely hit. And even if it does hit it, there's gonna be some cushion. So that's an easy one. And a lot of the, the window frames that people have today come down so you can unscrew them. And you can take those individual sliding screens and change the order. So you pop the one out, you pop the pop the other. I like that you're you're asking if you can do it though. <laughs> I saw that. Um, so you can you can change the order of them. So you put the screen on the outside, and even if it's a half screen, you're still getting rid of 50% of the issue. And then also, if you think about a bird being far away and deciding where it's going to go. You've made just even that as a flight option 50% less attractive. So you're, you're protecting 50% and really um, preventing some birds from even flying towards it. If you've got a school, that's great. Milwaukee Bucks, not so great. So tempura paint is cheap, non-toxic, lots of colors. It washes off really easy. There's all kinds of templates and patterns you can do. It's a great project to involve kids. Uh, you can change it whenever you want it. You make seasonal paintings, do it over and over again. But again, unless you're a nature center or a school, something like that, or your, your home, a lot of places wouldn't even consider that. Um, ABC has a product called Bird Tape, which some people really like, some people really don't like. We're neutral. If this is the one you like, it's terrific. We don't, there's no money made for ABC. You know, we just say, hey guys, make it as cheap as you can and get it out there for the people that like it. Um, so it comes in either a roll or squares, and you pretty much, it looks like masking tape, and you stick it up on the outside of the window in the right kind of patterns, and you gotta follow the two by four rules, and that's actually really effective. Um, before I joined ABC, I worked for Bird City, Wisconsin, and the Western Great Lakes Bird and Bat Observatory. And at the observatory at Forest Beach, there's the old clubhouse that was from the Squires Golf Course. 
and there was one corner there that had a ton of collisions. And uh, Bill Miller and I, we got a lift, and we put a bunch of this up, and it dropped to almost none immediately. So spring and fall were always really depressing. We did that, and now you know it's been one or two birds probably total. So it works. It's not for everybody though. Um, this is called a Zen Wind Curtain. There is a, a company that makes them called the Copian Bird Savers. Those guys are also in it for the exact right reason. On their website, they say, here's how to buy them. Here's how to make your own. So he just wants this product out there. Um, and it's pretty much a weighted parachute cord. So it's a, a thick rope with a little weight so that they hang straight. And if you're making your own, you can fix the bottom and the top so they're perfectly straight. If you've got them like these, they might blow around, blow around in the wind a little bit. Um, it's another thing where you can create I don't think that has it, but you can create, you can put them all on a hook, on a pole, and then put two hooks on the top. So if you've got a cabin, and somebody says, I don't want that stuff on the cabin when I'm there, you're at the cabin a couple weeks of the year. Put the screws up, you put the thing up when you leave, and for 90% of the year, the cabin is protected from being a bird collision threat. You get there, someone wants them down, you take them down. What always happens with these, though, People get used to it, and it's not such a big deal. And it doesn't take very long. Um, at, at my house, I put up one of the ones we'll show in a minute, Feather Friendly, which I'm not advocating over any of the others. I'm going to be putting some of these others on other windows, too, just to kind of have fun and test them out. Um, but, you know, my wife said, I don't like it. And I said, oh, I'll just quit my job, and we'll go we'll find something else to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but she got used to it. You know, they were up, and... You know, some of these you see better at night because there's light from the inside shining out and then it shines on whatever the solution is. But during the daytime, they're almost invisible. Um, but you get used to it and really when you know why it's there, who cares if you can see a couple dots or a couple of strings? You know you're not killing um, birds with your windows. This is another one called a, a bird crash preventer. And this works kind of a couple ways. Um, we tested it in the testing tunnel and it got a score, which means you know you could say it's bird friendly. So birds were able to see it and avoid it, even though the lines are really, really thin. I'm not sure if it's because they're like kind of like fishing line and they're a little transparent and they're doing something with the light. Um, but it's also a net. So if a bird actually does fall into that, most of them will bounce off and keep going. Now if it's like a red-breasted merganser, it's going to go right through that and hit your window. If it's a hairy woodpecker flying from 100 yards away straight at your window, it's going to go through that and hit your window. But it will do a pretty good job at reducing most collisions, which is really all we're after. Um, there's bird's eye view, and these are, the company says you're supposed to put them on the inside. Again, I would say outside, although I don't know what that would do to the longevity of the product. Um, these are ultraviolet, so it's both creating that signal by having something on the window, and then the ultraviolet light is supposed to kind of reflect and refract and extend a little bit beyond the edges of each of those. Um, again, if you have a huge 10 by 10 picture window and you put one in the middle, you don't really do very much. So you need to follow the spacing rules as much as you can. Um, window alert is the same thing. These are the ones you see at a lot of stores on the, on the counter. Hey, buy a window alert, and there's butterflies and snowflakes and all kinds of different designs. Um, but too many people buy three of them, throw them at the edges of one huge window, and say, wow, that thing doesn't work. It's because most of the window still essentially is not treated. So we're actually talking to them right now about how to change the wording on their box so that people know what to do to make it really effective and that one is not really going to cut it. Um, so this is both a physical obstruction and um, has ultraviolet and that one is supposed to go on the outside. Um, there are a lot of window films that you can put up too. Um, so these usually are professionally installed. You can do it yourself too but it pretty much covers the whole window and so you put up you know, you can, these companies can make whatever you want. You just tell them the pattern, the colors, whatever you want, they'll do whatever you say, and it's not too hard. Um, this one is the, 
the Intuit headquarters in Mountain View, California, and they have just a pretty standard straight black line. Um, I don't remember that. This one, you know, you see a lot of these in shopping areas and storefronts. They put up trees and designs. Those work. That's bird friendly, even though it was not intended to be. This building actually has these dots on it. So these are feather friendly dots. Um, they have a do it yourself product, which is essentially a roll of tape. And you put that roll of tape across and there's like a, a measuring guide you take to each end of your window to keep them straight. Um, and then you take a credit card across the back of the tape and then you pull off the back and it just leaves the dots. Now the first version of this, they created the dots were too small so it didn't really work. So then they increased the size of the dots and then it started working. So the first trial run on this, so these have those dots on them. And it works. You can kind of see them down here a little bit. Uh, but again, the first trial, the dots were a little too small, and they didn't work. So these dots, I think, are about a quarter of a in, in diameter. And you can say, I want bigger dots, and they will make you bigger dots. You can say, I don't want squares, and I want circles, and I want whatever, and they'll do it. Um, so there are all kinds of other options if you're talking about doing a large building. Uh, this is Kaleidoscape, which is bus wrap pretty much you know you see the ads printed on the back of a bus where people inside can see out but you from outside see the commercial um, you can get that in white and all kinds of different colors and that's really effective because it takes a window and makes it not a window so you know that's um, Cape May Community College and that was designed to be like a, a study space and kind of a common area and one of the employees who had to work in there said I can't you have to move my desk, I can't work in here anymore. And that person said, well, why? And he said, because it's just birds dying all day. I just sit here and listen to thud, thud, thud. And so they knew they had a collisions issue. And then in summer, it was too hot and too bright. So the students weren't even using it because they couldn't stand to be in there. So they put this up, and they put it all the way to the ground. That's halfway done. Um, and the birds stopped hitting the windows, and all of the students came back because now it wasn't too hot or too bright to actually be sitting in there and trying to do some work. Um, that's not a solution that is for very many people um, because most people still want more of a look of a window than that. But again, it works. And if that's the one you like, I'm all for the one you like. A lot of people say, well, pick one. Pick one solution and tell everybody one. And I say, I can't because everybody likes different stuff. And I want everybody to find something <coughs> that they like. Um, I will say that that website has some other things on it if you go to the Kaleidoscape site that I'm not sure will be as effective as that. Um, netting is also an option. That's the FBI building in Chicago. So you can just put a net up over the window if the net is the right colors and width and thickness. Birds will perceive the net and not even fly in there. And if they do and the net again is right they'll, and it's taut can't be loose like a banding net, otherwise they'll get stuck. They'll bounce. Again, it's not a perfect solution, but it is a solution. Um, the ultraviolet products, so these two are being hit with ultraviolet light, which is why they look like that. Um, I think this is this one under normal light. So if you're a bird that can see ultraviolet, you know, you can see the big bands, patterns. This one actually is pixie sticks, <laughs> which is kind of cool. Um, those are effective. And there are a number of companies that are really focusing on this going forward because you can't really see. And most of their building clients say, I don't want to see anything. And so if you have a UV solution, that could really appeal to a bunch of, a bunch of people, even though not all of the birds can see it. Um, so that's kind of a, a direction things are going in the future. Um, simply pull the shades. I mentioned that might be the answer if you have a fly-through condition. <coughs> But you can see when they're pulled, reflection is still strong. So pulling the shades may not do the trick. And depending on your shades and your windows, it might actually make the reflection stronger because you make it uniform. So if you have a bunch of depth behind your window and some light is getting through, there's at least something working to break up a little bit of it. Whereas if you then pull down the shade, you make everything uniform and you can make the reflection more appealing. Yeah. Uh, would that also be true with the kaleidoscape then? Would well, the kaleidoscape goes on the outside. It does go on the outside. Yeah. Okay. So you're, 
just you're pretty much covering the window. Okay. So it turns the window into something white or whatever color you want, really. Okay. Um, if you have blinds, Venetian blinds, I think those are called, leave them pitched. You know, if you're out, you don't pull them all the way shut. You don't pull the thing all the way up so they're not down. You turn them and, and leave. Now, if that window is highly reflective for part of the day, it's not going to work. But for the part of the day where those actually show through, you're giving a bird a pattern. And that doesn't cost anything. You just got to think to do it before you leave. Um, we're almost done here. So some of the other solutions that we have to do are educate people. If you don't know it's a problem, how can you fix it? And you hear that from a lot of the architects that we talk to. The one that designed the Bucks Stadium has offices in like 14 countries, and they do billions of dollars. And they said, you know, everybody here has heard a bird hit a window. We didn't know how big of a problem it was. We didn't know there was something we could do about it. And we didn't know the stuff we could do about it are things we already do. We just have to change a little bit. And so without that first conversation, they would have kept doing what they were doing. And so now in all the other building projects, the option to be bird friendly can be a part of it. Um, and again, really pointing out and hammering home, of that 599 million birds, 500,000 of them hit skyscrapers. So it's not just a big building problem downtown, it's every building. Um, and then if somebody actually does this, you make sure you go out and tell everybody else that they did it and find ways to tell people what happened. Um, then this we talked about a little bit. I don't want to interfere with the view. Nobody will notice. If you had an architect design a building, not mention bird friendly anything, put a bunch of frit patterns in it, someone will look at it and go, oh, that's beautiful. Look at the patterns. I love the way they play with the light. If you say, hey, I put all these patterns in it to save birds, they go, I don't want that crap. I want, what about the view? I can't see. So they don't notice. And not everybody, you know, that's not, <laughs> there's a lot of people in the middle <laughs> of, of those two. But those kind of extremes happen more than you would think. And there was one zoo that, not here, it's not Milwaukee, I'm not going to tell you who it was, but that wanted to fix some of their windows on their exhibits and on one of their buildings. And the person in charge said, nah, I don't think so, because I don't want stuff on the windows. And they finally wore him down and convinced him. He said, okay, 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 do it. And then like a month or two later, he said, are you guys ever going to put the stuff on the windows? And they said, look, it's up. And so he'd been walking in and out of the building for a month or two and didn't even know. And he was complaining about it before they even did it. He goes, ah, oh, it's not so bad. <laughs> so that really is something where it's hard to get somebody past that if that's their starting point. But really, it ends up not being a big deal. And if somebody says, well, why is that on the window? And you tell them, they're going to think you're twice as cool as they did before because they see that you did something that involved a little bit of planning and an effort to save life. Um, kind of did most of this already. You know, From this slide, I will say, new construction is always better than retrofitting. So if you can get to that new building, you do it before they've designed it. A lot of times people call me and they say, oh, hey, there's a big hole in the ground with a bunch of steel. Can you fix it? Well, you're probably too late because at some point they start signing contracts with material companies and then the companies know they got you. So if you sign your purchase order with the glass company, even though it doesn't have to show up for three more months, breaking that contract, there's a big penalty for it. And then an in-house order change, they know they don't have to beat anybody else's competing offer so they can charge you more. So the earlier the better, um, and new construction is always better than retrofit. However, <coughs> If we made every single building, homes included, bird friendly from here forward, all we do is hit pause on the one billion birds a year until you've replaced every building. And think about how long it would take to replace every single window that is out there right now. So only focusing on new construction is also not the answer. We have to do both, even though it makes it a lot more work. Um, we talked about lead already. So, I will say thank you for inviting me here. Thank you for the collisions and actions I know you're all gonna take. Um, if you're not an ABC member, I would invite you to go and become an ABC member. The membership is a kind of a key supporter and a reason why we're able to come out and, and do talks like this. Um, and I will leave you, we have a number of resources. Um, we're redoing the website right now. So early next year, 
it's going to be way better than the website we've got right now. So you're going to be able to go there and easily find the path you want, to the information you want, and the solutions you want. Right now, you kind of have to hunt around because the amount of stuff up there has exploded in the last 10 years. And what worked 10 years ago in terms of housing everything effectively doesn't work anymore. Um, the easy one to remember is if you go to birdsmartglass.org, that takes you to the page of solutions we've got. So they're tunnel tested. We know they're going to work. If you put those up, you will reduce collisions, assuming you follow the instructions. Um, there are more solutions that are going to come to that with the new website. We're kind of limited in how big our list of stuff can be at the moment. So I showed you more stuff here than is probably up there. Um, and then we have a number of downloads at collisions.abcburns.org, including a bird-friendly building design book. And I think it's about 70 pages long, but it covers this issue front to back. And we update and revise this periodically. So you can download that and it's free. Um, and there's all kinds of other stuff at the, the download site. So thank you. Any questions? Yeah, I have two questions. So going back to where you locate your bird feeders, mm -hmm. if you have bird feeders at 15 and you bring them in to 10, thinking about that chart that you had, yeah. it seemed to be a significant that five feet seem to be significant in terms of reducing the, the, the worst collisions. Is that right? Uh, that I mean, right? The, the, the percent that would be fatal would go yeah. down because right. you're essentially removing right. a third of the distance right. that the bird So even from to 15 to 10 to 8 to 7 would help. Yeah. Okay. And then but, so but the thing that, again, that, that doesn't really capture yep. is I don't know the percentage of collisions you're going to get if you do that. So at 15 feet, birds might be able to fly up and over if you've got a one-story house or be able to say, I'm going to go that way instead. Whereas if it's six feet away from your house or eight feet away, up might no longer be an option yeah. because the window is now a bigger percentage of what that bird sees looking at direction. So I talk about that only, I always hesitate. <laughs> so many people have seen that chart and you know get confused by it. Instead, you know, I, it's not clear. So if you've got a problem, you can try it, and maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. You know, offsetting it again could work. But really, just treating the, treating the window is the best. So, so treating the window. So people have big picture windows so that they can see them, mm -hmm. and they put bird feeders out so they can see the birds feed. So, of those <coughs> different solutions, what will give you the best view? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I mean, they all they all work to kind of minimize the visual obstruction right. as much as they can. The, but they all get in your way of seeing. They all do. I mean, you, I mean, you will see that whatever is out there is there. Yep. And the more effective they are, more more than likely, the more you'll see it. So like those Ecopian bird savers, which work great if they're two or three inches apart, are one of the more visible solutions if you compare it to like the, the bird crash preventer, which was the fishing line kind of one. That's not very visible, but it's not going to work as well as the Ecopian bird saver. So it kind of comes down to personal taste and trade-offs and what you're willing to do. Um, none of those cost very much. Actually, the UV decals cost a bit because they're like three or four bucks a piece in some cases. And if you're going to put enough of them up there on a bunch of windows, it kind of starts to add up. But that's still not $5,000. So. Yeah, so this is again that kind of, do we do one solution or do we put everything out there we can and let people choose? Um, so, you know, you can spend a little more time looking at the pictures and the, the sites on that bird smart glass. And, yeah. um, is this discussion and effort concentrated in the United States or is this something that you're seeing in other countries? Um, so, other countries do. Next? No. <laughs> I'll give you more of that. Um, so we are American Bird Conservancy because most of what we do is in the Americas. The collisions and the cat issue are kind of the two departments that are bigger. Um, so, you know, there is the Fatal Light Attraction Awareness. I can never remember which program in Canada, FLAP, which does a lot of this same kind of stuff in Canada. 
Um, we try and have our Latin American partners, you know, in like eco lodges and things like that, start to put some of this up. Um, we're going to work on a new program, um, Bird City. It's going to be way bigger pretty soon. Um, and we're going to try and use that as a vehicle over the rest of the country in Latin America and Canada to get more people doing this kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> I do look for opportunities though, and I had a good call with someone in China. And they said, hey, here's a bird friendly building because we built like nest structures into it. And I kind of thought, ah, that's not really what we mean when we say. <laughs> I said, but you know, he seems to have the ear of a lot of people. So I said, hey, can I Skype you at midnight my time, please? <laughs> and so we had, a, we had a good talk. And you know, it turns out like the UN Conference on the Environment is going to be there. And so all those places are kind of racing for green stuff they can do. And Beijing is redoing its building code. And you know he works with a bunch of big companies, and I was like, all right, well, start pitching them, and I will do whatever you need. Um, so, but those are kind of exceptions. There is some of this going on in Europe. That first test tunnel is in Europe and Germany. Their definition of a bird-friendly product coming out of the tunnel is stricter than ours. So they want only the stuff that is like 10 or under, whereas ours is 25 or under. Because 25 or under, you know, we say at 25, we're confident it's going to reduce collisions by at least half. Whereas if you go only 10 or under, it's going to be more effective, but fewer people are going to do it because it's a way stronger pattern. So we want to do as much as we can, realizing we're not going to get everything. Um, but so in, in Europe, there are efforts going on too. Sure. <laughs> okay, well. Uh, you stick around. Got you, got you. We've got a question. Quick one. Sure. Why did the bird cave it look more like a bird bar? It was really, really wide. Could it have been much narrower? Probably. Okay. It probably. It probably can be. Yeah. That was just what, you know, the bird tape was one of the older products. And it was one of the first ones because there wasn't much out there. Thought, Let's make cheap tape and we'll get it so people can put it up and. Um, so yeah, those could probably be a little thinner. You can probably make all kinds of other patterns. So I'm working on finding a new distributor for that. So it's off the market for the moment. Um, and part of the plan is colors and shapes and sizes and different stuff and try and make it a little more fun. But it could probably be a little narrower. You had a question, Brad? Um, I was wondering, so we have a couple of new buildings here in the town that are pretty heavy with glass. Like what would you recommend approaching or what we could recommend to these places? Like what is an insurance building? We're trying to get, I'm sure a lot of you all know. And like suggesting window films or how would we go about? It's tough. Yeah. I mean the the best thing to do is if you have monitoring data, okay. say Here's a picture of a pile of birds. And you know where I got them? Right in front of your building. And to be able to kind of, again, refine what your ask is. So if you go in and say, you know, this guy showed up and he knows what he's talking about and he's pretty sure your building is going to be bad and you need to do the whole thing and it's going to be $200,000. They're going to say, oh, it was nice to meet you. And they're going to go back inside. <laughs> if you come in and say, I'm concerned, I have, we've collected over the last two migration seasons, these birds. I know most of them hit these three spots. I'm trying to make this as realistic for you as possible. <clears throat> Can we talk about fixing these three areas? They'll probably invite you in. Um, but again, it's not cheap. You know, some of those Northwestern buildings were six figures. But they did. The, they just said, all right, we're going to do the whole thing. I said, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. <laughs> Figure out the problems, and let's do four buildings instead of one. Um, also making sure your initial approach <coughs> is like measured and reasonable because they don't have to talk to you. And so I think too often in the conservation community, we just expect everybody to do the stuff we, we do. And if you walk into that saying, why aren't you? <laughs> They're going to say, because I didn't know it was a problem. Thanks for being a jerk. Bye. <laughs> but if you walk in and say, did you know this is happening and I can help help you fix the worst parts of it? And understand they don't have to do anything. They don't have to talk to you. Um, and you know, try and think of it from their side. Of, this guy I don't know is coming in and he's probably going to ask me to spend a bunch of money. Uh, 
Um, always kind of keeping that in the back of your mind goes really far. So the Milwaukee Bucks thing took a long time because they said, we'll do this, but we're not doing that. And I said, oh, come on, guys. You can do that. And they said, all right, we'll do that, but we're not doing the first thing we said we would do. I said, oh, come on. You already said you'd do it. All right, we'll do this, but half of that one. He said, oh, come on. They said, all right, we'll do the whole thing, but we're not going to apply for the credit. I said, why won't you apply for the credit? You'll be first. <laughs> but, you know, I, I cut the slide out because it was not about the box, but I call it an exercise in being a likable pain in the ass. <laughs> because you got to keep, like, after them. But if they don't like you, it's over. So um, that would be it. If you can do some monitoring of those buildings, you know, even starting, you know, right now. <laughs> kind of getting a little bit late to have a full fall migration season, but you know, show them it will be tougher. Okay, Brian will stick around for more questions and answers. Uh, meanwhile, we've got goodies. And uh, if I can get a little help to uh, put up the chairs, I'd appreciate it. But don't forget the goodies. There are plenty of them. Yeah. <laughs> 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 